Welcome to New West Press Audio, the official podcast of New West Press. We're an independent publishing outfit located in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Uh, my name is Matt Bose. I'm the general manager here at New West. And with me today is AJ Devlin, author of the first book of our fall 22 season, uh, Five Moves of Doom. Uh, how are you today, AJ? I'm good, thank you, Matt. How are you? I am well. Uh, not looking forward to winter time, but uh, at least it's not 35 degrees here anymore. So that's good. That's a good uh, start. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Five Moves of Doom. So this is the third book in the Hammerhead Jed uh, book series, uh, which is about a former pro wrestler who has become a private investigator. Uh, do you want to tell our listeners a bit about the series if they haven't read them yet and maybe why they should? Sure. Yeah. Um, Hammerhead Jed series is about an ex-professional wrestler uh, turned uh, private eye in Vancouver. And um, in the first book in the series, Cobra Clutch, he's sort of drawn back into the world of independent wrestling, which he came from uh, before he went on to bigger success in, in uh, WWE. Um, and um, he catches a case about a, a former tag team partner who uh, has a, kid, a snake that he wrestles with who's kidnapped and held for ransom. Um, and then ba uh, based off the success of that case, he is then uh, starts working as a private investigator with his father, who's a retired uh, Vancouver police officer who has a um, agency downtown, downtown Vancouver. And then he uh, catches a case that takes him into the, the women's flat track roller derby in Rolling Thunder. And then Five Moves of Doom is uh, 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 Jed catches or is hired by a, um, ex um, UFC fighter turned trainer in Vancouver who uh, has a championship uh commemorative championship ufc belt uh that is uh, stolen and um he's uh he hires hammerhead jed to go into it and during the course of his investigation he's drawn into the world of uh, a sort of a tight-knit underground fight club yeah so all three of your books so far have delved into kind of i don't know alternative sports i guess you'd say uh it's something that everyone knows about but not everyone's going to have personal experience with right and for MMA, so you were working on this during the pandemic, and as such, you're probably not able to attend very many MMA fights. Whereas with, you know, Cobra Clutch, you could attend small wrestling promotions and Rolling Thunder, you could attend um, Flat Track Roller Derby. So did it change your process much to kind of be working from videos or like how did you approach your research when you couldn't really go in person right at that time uh that's a great question i, I kind of got lucky in the order of which these um sort of fringe sports that i've uh had my detective go into um i got lucky in the order in the sense that um i was able to get out to the indie shows for wrestling and, and get out to the roller derby matches and um i also probably those are those are more experiences i think that um are harder to find online. Whereas with um, Five Moves of Doom, with mixed martial arts being so big, um, it, there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of internet rabbit holes to go down. Um, and um, But I wanted to really focus on sort of the underground aspect and sort of the grittier uh, aspects. So not sort of the, the, the glamour or the stuff you see at the pay-per-views or the UFC. I wanted like the stuff that, you know, isn't really necessarily talked about. And there's a lot of... Um, you know, gritty YouTube videos that I watched. Um, there's a story of a, of a, of a street fighter like named Kimbo Slice who kind of became an internet phenomenon. Um, there was a series of uh, YouTube videos fighting in the age of loneliness, which were really, really helpful. Um, and then there was an article in um, Salon, um, a magazine, salon.com, which um, was really uh, helpful for me to um, sort of sort of frame uh, how exactly I wanted this world to be um, you know, familiar to those that uh, are fans of mixed martial arts, but also sort of offers maybe an edgier uh, element to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, MMA is weird because when I was growing up, it felt like a genuinely sort of dangerous profession or a dangerous social thing that was happening. Like a, it was echoing something dark in our culture, like, oh, there's blood sports for money. And it felt like, you know, something you would see in ancient Rome or something, these guys breaking each other's arms and stuff. And it's since been so commodified, right? Like mm -hmm. you can go to Boston pizza and watch a yeah. UFC <laughs> fight. Yeah. Like it's a, it seems pretty family friendly now. And like, I'm sure maybe teenagers probably, but you could probably go to like an MMA camp or something, right? Like, Oh, probably. Yeah. I mean, it, 
it's kind of weird though, right? Like it, it came from completely underground fighting leagues where people are betting and, you know, that sort of thing, but completely got commodified. And what was it like to kind of try and bring it back to that underground sort of stuff? Because, you know, with, with wrestling and roller derby, it's these big personas and these rivalries and things that you could kind of, as a fan, latch on to. But when it's an underground fighting league, you don't really want to tell people that you were at the underground fighting league, right? Like it, it's right. sort of a uh, entertainment that is still illicit in a way. Yes. No, absolutely. Um, it, it definitely lasts, lacks sort of the flair and panache of, uh, of independent wrestling or any form of wrestling, professional wrestling and um, roller derby for sure. Uh, there's a lot of theatricality there that that's uh, so much fun. Um, but, the, you know, there's no characters or gimmicks in uh in these, uh, you know, the UFC, or the mixed martial arts, especially if you take it back to its roots, to its gritty origins, which is what I tried to do for um, this particular story. And um, uh, at first, I, um, you know, I've, I was familiar with, um, you know, mixed martial arts and stuff. And, and um, but I really wanted to sort of go back to the beginning. Um, so initially, I did watch, you know, movies like uh, Bloodsport or, or Lionheart, which, you know, they had the right idea, but, you know, there's a significant amount of cheese factor. Uh, yeah. with those uh, some of those 80s movies which um which wasn't what i was going for um and then but then uh my research sort of eventually led me into um sort of these more darker corners of uh, of uh the sport and the origins of the sport and then um sort of becoming well versed in that definitely was when a narrative um sort of took shape and and how i wanted to present uh the this this world and um and 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 it is it is underground and it's meant to stay underground. It's not mm-hmm. these people in the, that he goes that Hammerhead goes up against in, in encounters in Five Moves of Doom. Uh, there's no intention of commercializing the sport or they're doing their thing for their own reasons. And uh, that was fun to sort of explore that uh, authenticity, if you will. Mm-hmm. You have to be a very specific kind of person to be drawn to an underground fighting league. Um, I often wonder that when you're watching uh, like a post-apocalyptic movie or something and you're like, oh yeah, look at all these people who are at the the fighting championship that our hero has to survive. It's like, well, do they just go home to their jobs afterwards? Like, <laughs> yeah. do, you t- do you talk around the water cooler? Like, yeah, I saw that guy rip someone's head off and uh, beat him to death with his own nuts or something. Like, it, 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 just, it just seems so incongruous to how sort of boring normal life is. So I, can, I definitely see the appeal. I could see why someone who's sort of fed up with finality of uh, existence wants to prove themselves. And it's like, if you learn all this um, martial arts, you kind of, you kind of want to use it, right? Like, I know that a lot of the Eastern martial arts, it's like, oh, only use it if your life is in danger. But Obviously, you'd probably want to bust it out at some point if you knew Kung Fu or whatever. So it's it's a vaguely socially acceptable way of doing it. I think so. Yeah. I mean, because it's mixed martial arts, it's not a specific, uh, you know, discipline. It's sort of, um, you know, uh, maybe lacking that spiritual, uh, you know, aspect to it. And it's it's really fundamentally about the combat and then the blending of styles. Mm -hmm. And um, and um, I mean, you look at a movie like Fight Club, the way it sort of starts out is about you know these frustrated guys with angst and whatnot but then it kind of turns into a bigger story about you know anarchy which is great but that's i didn't want to i didn't want any escalation like that i wanted to sort of stay yeah. on point with regards to you know what is it about the combat but it is about the fighting like there's there's no there's no oh uh you know don't strike first element to it like these guys are going there to to wail on each other and to and to use their skills for a reason and for their, you know, different reasons. And, and that was fun to explore and then craft characters with, you know, different yet similar motivations um, that operate in, in these real life pockets of, uh, of mixed martial arts that, um, that are what they are and they kind of work to stay what they are. It also feels like uh, Chuck Palahniuk's uh, Fight Club, like became a cliche almost an instantly, right? Like, that movie came out, it was such a big deal. And then you start hearing about, oh, Fight Club's on campus and stuff. And then immediately everyone just sort of backed away, just like, oh yeah, 
maybe they understood the point of the book. I, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe having a fight club isn't as cool as it sounds, but uh, this is the third book in your trilogy. And you kind of said it's going to be sort of a capstone for a bit, just kind of be, gives you a reset and kind of um, puts Jed in a place where he can kind of stay on ice for a little bit. Do you want to talk about your sort of um, planning for the character? And was this always the goal? Was it these three sports in a row? Or did it kind of come more organically as you learned about these subcultures? What was your what was your process? Uh, def- definitely the latter. It definitely, um, I, I knew starting kicking off a series or what was you know intended to and hopefully to be a series character um, coming from professional wrestling, I knew that I kind of needed to address that right off the bat. And, um, and, uh, and it's always really fun to go into the independent wrestling world and, and then really to do that justice because, um, you know, I think a lot of people that watch professional wrestling don't realize the amount of effort and the way people will sort of climb up through uh, the indie leagues in order till they get to that, you know, those big WrestleMania moments that become pop culture, you know, touchstones. Um, and then roller derby just seemed like a natural transition um there's a lot of similarities with uh you know the, the theatrics and the names and 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 the character names and whatnot and um and then a character from a lady wrestler from the first book uh is actually left wrestling and then she's um now in roller derby in the second book and then she goes and solicits uh, jed and hires him uh for their team to, to um, find their missing coach so there was sort of this real connective tissue and then that story I wanted to pick up about six months after he's been working as a professional wrestler or as a professional wrestling PI. And, um, and so, um, when it, when it came time to do a third one, I, then it, I kind of realized, um, I wanted to tell sort of a, uh, not a complete story, but I wanted to tell like, uh, a, a first, second and third chapters of, of his first year. So that's, what's kind of exciting for me with this book is that um, it kind of puts a button on his first full year as a as an investigator. So Cobra Clutch is sort of his debut and his first big case. And then I'd say in, in many ways, Five Moves of Doom is his um, most challenging and difficult case. And it kind of uh, brings his first year as an investigator full circle. Um, but the, the doors are certainly left open for future adventures, future mysteries. But um, it does leave the character in, 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 I think, an interesting place. So there's a degree of closure that I, that I wanted there. Um, and uh, but there's also it's definitely open ended. Um, and so mm-hmm. um, so, yeah, so that was that was kind of fun to sort of write sort of a trilogy that could, you know, hopefully can be more, but also can stand on its own as, a, as sort mm-hmm. of a set of a set of stories. Yeah, it's sort of like uh, Philip Kerr's um, Berlin trilogy, which he wrote. I hope you don't do this, but he wrote those like 15 years before doing the next ones in the series. And then he got the rest of them out pretty quickly but it's just sort of I want to I have a few things I want to say I'm going to say them all right here and then I'm going to keep that uh, detective in my back pocket for when I want him later so it's yes. you know it's it, there is a precedent um, something that happens in this book which uh, does not happen in any of the other ones is that uh, Jed is not always the uh, focal character for a lot of this book you find yourself writing in the voices of a few other people in his life. Uh, I don't want to say why, but there's some stuff that happens. Uh, do you want to talk about that? Was that uh, difficult or was it fun to flex your writing muscles on that or how'd that go? That, um, that's, that was a, that's a great question. And yeah, um, that was not something I ever really planned until I started uh, revisions with um, my, my editor and, um, and uh, he was great and he was challenging me. And I knew that um, I kind of sensed something was missing and I couldn't quite put my finger on it. And, um, but the, the, the genesis and the idea for this book really came down because what I try to do is, is I try to tell like the mystery and, you know, the fringe sport or the unique subculture in which he touches the case and, and works, but also what is his personal journey um, you know, in each book. And so with Cobra Clutch, it's sort of about, he used to be a wrestler. His dad's putting pressure on him to be a detective. He's working as a bouncer and an errand boy for his father's detective agency. And then solving his, you know, or working on his friend's his missing snake is sort of a catalyst that sort of jump starts him and forces him to sort of, you know, move on with his life. And then the second book was like, okay, what if he, he's now a detective and he's, 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 uh, you know, really into it and it's going well and he's, he's got a natural aptitude for it. And so I wanted to play, 
with that, him sort of being um, off to the races as a detective, this one, um, especially with the first two books, he he's so def- being an ex pro wrestler and a big guy, and um, you know, and, tra- and also trained in different st- styles of mixed martial arts himself. Um, this is a guy that was so. This is a character that I, I meant to always be so defined by his physicality. And so, when looking to find that challenge for the third book, um, uh, I very quickly landed upon: well, what if he isn't the biggest, toughest guy around? What if he? What if you take away? Uh, you know, Superman's cape, you know, what's, uh, what's, you know, what's left, like, if you strip him down, and and you take away that advantage that he's so used to, and he's left mostly to rely on his wits and his, um, and his uh, resilience and his mental toughness, that seemed very, like a very exciting place to take the character, and it felt like the right time to do it, especially after the first two uh, books, Um, so um, I don't think it would have worked as well had I tried to start the series with that, or done it right after Uh, as a direct sequel Um, but so it kind of it definitely sort of came about organically but then it it definitely felt right and a lot of this series um, I think actually originally I had the mixed martial arts um, backdrop set uh, penned in for book four um, and then I shuffled it because it became clear to me this is where I wanted to go and then it felt like just going back to what I was saying about sort of telling sort of a, a, a trilogy in that first just first year of stories for him felt like the right time to go there um and then to, you know and so that's the real trick for me is to balance the mystery and the you know the 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 the, the backdrop and the french sport unique subculture with whatever he's going through personally uh, and what the case mm-hmm. forces him to sort of realize and uh, you know confront about himself yeah and it's going to add texture for books down the line now that you know he's uh um been humbled to a certain extent he's going to be not as impulsive and as sure of himself as he was in the first two books. So it's going to make the character richer, I think. That, I mean, that was the hope. Um, and that's definitely what I wanted to do. Um, and, 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 you know, like the idea is for all these books, of course, to have connective tissue. But I, 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 like, to th- I, I like to think that maybe the connective tissue in the, in the first three books is going to be tighter. Whereas uh, when we pick up with, you know, if we pick up with the fourth book and explore that, like there's still going to be connective tissue to the first three, but also it might be, you know, he's in a different place and he's, you know, embarking on different adventures. And um, so, yeah, so there's something very satisfying about telling that sort of complete full story of his first year as a detective. And then, but then, you know, leaving the door open for, um, you know, um, many more adventures, hopefully. Yeah. The origin story is done. Now you can just kind of, focus on interesting new cases and the character is sort of coalesced. Uh, yes. I mean, I, I'm, ha- I'm very happy with where he is and, um, and I'm very happy with sort of, uh, sort of in a way, the button, this third uh, story uh, puts on, uh, you know, this initial trilogy and, um, you know, and it was fun too. It was fun. It's a little grittier and it's a little, um, it's probably of the three, it's probably the more mature of, of, of the three books, I think. Um, and, um, and I think really it, it comes from wanting to showcase a more vulnerable side of him. Um, and, um, you know, and then being sort of this larger than life, you know, ex wrestler turned detective and, you know, dealing with independent wrestling world and roller derby. Like there is, there is so much theatricality in those first two books that that's definitely sort of dialed down a bit. I mean, it still maintains sort of uh, the humor and the, um, you know, the, the escapism that I want to be intrinsic to the series, but also, I wanted to sort of to ground him in a way and to um, to really sort of explore him psychologically, maybe perhaps a little deeper than, um, you know, uh, than I have in, in some of the, the, the previous books. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you've got a uh, sample from the book for our readers. Why don't you set that up? Yes. So this would be um, chapter two. Um, so there's a prologue and then chapter one takes place six weeks before the prologue. And um, in chapter one, it's a little, a little bit long for reading. So, um, but basically, he's uh, chapter one. He's hired by a uh, former UFC fighter turned uh, local trainer in, in Metro Vancouver, um, and someone has um, broken into his dojo and stolen his uh, commemorative championship UFC belt uh, that he uh, was a prized possession. And then he also used and had framed on the wall as inspiration for a lot of the at-risk youth that he trains in, in the neighborhood. And um, so, he, and then by now Hammerhead Jet has sort of developed a, a, you know, a bit of a reputation as a guy that you hire for maybe some cases that are a little offbeat. And so um, 
and then of course with him and his, his wrestling background, he seemed like a good, he seems like a good fit. So he's hired by the um, dojo owner, the uh, former uh, UFC fighter turned trainer. And, um, and so he's accepted the case and he's, um, he's left the dojo with a list of some uh, uh, names of anybody that might have access to uh, the dojo after hours. And, um, and then this is him um, in a suburb of a greater or a suburb of, of Vancouver. And um, he's, uh, he's, he's sort of running over the case that he's agreed to take on and trying to figure out his next step. So uh, without any further ado, this is uh, chapter two of Five Moves of Doom. The windows were up and the air conditioning was on full blast as my Ford F-150 snaked down and around the left of Moody Street. On the other side of the intersecting, intersecting road, a large electric cursive sign bathed in Parkside Brewery's patio in bright, bathed Parkside Brewery's patio in bright green light as dusk approached. Across the way, past Rocky Point, rays of sunshine fought valiantly to continue sparkling and dancing atop the dark blue water of the Pacific Ocean, but it was a losing battle. I pulled into the parking lot and found a spot near a food truck. I stopped by the mobile eatery, ordered a slab of bacon pulled pork with onions on a ciabatta bun, then headed outside. Five minutes later, I was at a picnic table, eating my sandwich and nursing a pint of Parkside's dusk pale ale while watching the sunset across the broad inlet. I finished my meal and nursed my pint, then pulled the folded envelope that Lennox had given me from my pocket. I left the retainer check to Aunt and Son Investigations in the envelope, but retrieved the paper with the names I had requested. The list wasn't long. Right off the bat, I dismissed those 14 or under, as it's hard to believe that anyone that age would have had the nerve to break in or the skill to pick a lock without leaving so much as a scratch. That left five names of kids ranging between 16 and 21. I circled them. I get my old man to see what he could dig up on them on my return to the Emerald Shillelagh, our family pub, which was conveniently located beneath the second floor office of our detective agency. I was about to refold the paper and return to my pocket when a name at the bottom of the page caught my eye, Wally Fitzgibbons. I took a long sip of my beer. There was something about that name, but I couldn't quite place it. Fitzgibbons was listed as the lone janitor for Lennox kickboxing and pancreation. According to the printout, he had been employed there for several years. I took another swig of my brew and gave up trying to figure out why that particular name was causing an itch in the back of my brain. I pulled out my iPhone, but hesitated. Although my technology challenged father had finally joined the rest of the civilized world by purchasing a smartphone, he still preferred an old fashioned phone rather than phone call rather than communicating via SMS or iMessage. I rolled the dice and decided to text my old man anyway, in the hopes that the pleasant summer evening I was enjoying would not be uprooted by an abrupt, gruff chinwag with an irascible senior son of a gun. I fired off a text message to my father that, although the name Wally Fitzgibbons rang a bell, for the life of me, I could not remember why. Three minutes later, I had my response. My pop had quickly re re replied, Robson Street. I was at a loss to know what he was trying to communicate, but I did appreciate the prompt reply, so I texted right back. What on Robson Street? Three dots flickered across my iPhone screen, as he took way too long to craft a response. Courthouse in the 90s, he replied. Don't you remember? I racked my brain for an answer, but drew a blank. Old case, I messaged back. Seconds later, I received an iMessage response consisting of two eggplant emojis, followed by an exclamation point. Not wanting to waste time, as I was sure my father had no idea what his newly discovered emojis actually meant, I responded with a curt, what the hell does that mean? Two thumbs up, replied the Vancouver Police Department's living legend. I shook my head as I informed my old man the meaning of what he had just texted. Pop, you just sent me two emojis of purple eggplants. They're used to symbolize penises. I don't know if that was possible, but I saw the three dots were moving faster than usual across my screen as Frank fired off his retort. Jesus jumped up, Christ, not dicks, goddammit. Two big thumbs up is what I meant. I threw in the towel and decided that any further attempt to text message tutorials on my end would only lead to trouble. Just tell me why you recognize the name Wally Fitzgibbons and if his age fits with any perp you're familiar with. Seconds later, I had a response. It does, and I can't believe you don't remember. First time I ever brought you to see me testify in court was against Fitzgibbons. I searched my mind for memory, but still came up empty. Domestic abuse, I guessed. Robbery, replied my father. I killed the rest of my pale ale and scratched my head. Still clueless about how the name Wally Fitzgibbons was connected to my past. Why can't I place him, I asked. Don't know, came the reply. You would think you'd remember the best jewel thief the city's ever seen.
and that is chapter two of Five Moves of Doom. Oh, uh, so trouble. Yeah, I forgot to mention too that the commemorative championship belt is encrusted with uh, um, cushion cut diamonds. Hence, yeah. the, uh, hence the jewel thief. Yeah, he might have an interest in that. So um, Five Moves of Doom is available in about a week from recording. So probably when you hear this, it should be out there in the world. So I suggest you go get one. Um, do you have any events coming up that you want to tell our audience about? I do, yeah. Um, I have some exciting things happening. Um, starting with the the official um, launch for Five Moves of Doom in my hometown of Port Moody, where um, a part of the story is set. And that's at Parkside Brewery, the brewery I actually just mentioned. And um, that's going to be on September 18th um, in the afternoon. Uh, and there'll be uh, books and beer for sale. And, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, fortunate enough, I'm able to do it with uh, fellow New West Press uh, authors and crime writers, uh, D.B. Carew um, and um, J.T. Siemens will be there as well. So that's going to be a lot of fun. And then on September 28th, I'm doing a uh, joint launch and reading event at the Port Moody Library with um, Canadian crime writer uh, Deborah Purdy Kong for her debut uh, novella, uh, Sat a Gold, a Gold Satin Murder um, is the name of her novella. And it's a continuation of her um, novel series, a Casey Holland uh, Transit Cop series. And so that's, that's uh, at the end of September. And then on October 1st, I'm particularly excited about um, something we're doing called a, um, we're calling it a independent bookstore crawl. And it's myself, uh, JT Siemens, DD Crew, um, Deborah Purdy Kong, and um, uh, another uh, New Westminster crime writer, Winona Kent. And um, we're going, starting off at a, a coastal bookstore in Port Moody on a Saturday morning, and we're doing signings and um, selling books there. And then we're going to Western Sky Books in Port Moody, or in uh, Port Coquitlam, in the afternoon and um, we'll be promoting and, and selling and signing books there as well. Um, just trying to, uh, to whip up interest in these amazing local bookstores and, um, and support. And then also um, encouraging donations for the Port Moody libraries, um, children's programs and uh, crime fiction collections. And then uh, that rolls into October when I'm gonna be doing some um, traveling and I'm gonna be coming to Alberta and I'll be doing launch events with uh, Neil Howell, um, author of uh, uh, they're uh, only pretty damned and they're wolves um, here too, which just uh, came out uh, the other day. Um, and uh, he's, a, he's a friend and a, a fantastic talent. So we're doing events in uh, Edmonton and Calgary. Um, and then I will be going to Victoria, I think, in early November to do an event, uh, launch event there. So plenty of uh, ways to come out and meet uh, AJ, buy a copy of the book and I think at almost all of those drink a beer, even if it's just secretly in a bookstore. <laughs> uh, so plan. thanks. <laughs> thanks for coming on the podcast today. You bet. Thank you for having me. So this is Matt Bowes from New West Press Audio signing off.